Well, welcome to another edition to the virtual TAC room on this uh, Saturday, May the 16th. It is uh, Victoria Day weekend, a long holiday weekend here in Prince Edward Island. Uh, I'm Lee Drake, one of your uh, hosts for this evening's uh, broadcast, and um, we're looking forward to the show tonight. You know, uh, we have a great list of uh, guests with us tonight, videos, the photo parade coming up your way tonight as well. So we hope you uh, settle in on this uh, Saturday night and enjoy the show for the next uh, couple hours. Coming up, we have Gerard Smith, along with James McDonald and Adam Murner. So a couple of housekeeping items first. Um, let's start with uh, the past week. You know, every time we do a virtual uh, tax show and we get ready to go for the, the, the next show, there have been uh, several announcements throughout the past week, uh, many positive announcements. Uh, the government and the public health office have been doing a great job of informing islanders and getting everyone up to speed on what's going on in our, our province and uh throughout that past week of course we've heard um some announcements of course you know about the june 4th date in in charlottetown um also uh we also heard this week that uh, other tracks across canada have been given the green light especially at mohawk we've uh, that's uh, great news i know we'll be talking to james mcdonald about that as well and then uh, some of our friends in the u.s as well also getting the green light to race as well so it is something that it's taken some time for sure, and uh, but I think uh, everyone's doing their part, and we're just excited to try to get back to uh, somewhat normal or normal can be when we get started. But it's nice to see the stars coming on the track again. Tonight's uh, virtual tax show is brought to you in part uh, brought to you by McRae Backhoe and Trucking and McRae Racing. I want to thank Donnie McRae for stepping in and uh, wanted to uh, sponsor the virtual tax room. So we appreciate that. So an action packed show tonight. Let's go out and bring in my co-hosts for this evening. As uh, once again, it's always great to uh, talk to them throughout the week and set the show up. We're pretty excited about this show. Go to Cornwall first to my co-host from Red Shores. Um, Peter McPhee. Peter, uh, great to see you this week uh, and tonight on the show. How are you doing? How are you doing, Lee? Uh, thanks again uh, for uh, hosting tonight. It's going to be another great show, as you mentioned. Hi to Jerry and Kent as well. Looking forward to a great show. I was out today, Lee, uh, with the family, uh, out for a walk today. It was a, a really nice day here in PEI. Turned out to be really nice this afternoon. Lee, we're getting closer to those qualifiers next Saturday, and that means we're getting closer to live racing. So again, Get the qualifiers in the next uh, week or so, and we'll be at that live racing date on June 4th. Looking forward to that. All right, Peter, and uh, over to Jerry McCabe. Jerry, good to see you again. How has uh, your week been? Doing well here, Lee. Uh, welcome, uh, Peter and Kent. Uh, good to be here. Things are starting to look a little brighter. The sunshine, uh, some nicer days this past week. Good to get outdoors and enjoy some of that. And, of course, like everybody else, looking forward to next week's uh, qualifiers and the racing action not too far away now. There's hope in our immediate future, and it's looking forward to it. All right, and also, of course, uh, the show creator joining us once again for Virtual Attack Room. It's been many weeks now. It's hard to believe uh, we've had so many shows under our belt, and that's Kent Oaks joining us on the phone tonight. Good evening, Kent. Good evening, uh, Lee. Good evening, everyone. It's great to see everyone. and. Uh, it was a beautiful day today. Uh, uh, it was certainly really exciting to see uh, so many people out and about today at the at the track. They were jogging there this afternoon, and uh, the track had a real good renovation, getting ready for our 2020 ra uh, racing season uh, there the last few days. And uh, no, it's uh, going to be wonderful to see everyone back on the track next week. All right, so let's get rolling with our opening quarter here tonight, and uh, it is a pleasure to work with him uh, over the years. And tonight, he's uh, he's a guest uh, on the virtual attack room. He's our race secretary. He's a two-time Hall of Famer, and uh, with many sports on on Prince Edward Island, with hockey and baseball, and of course, uh, the Atlantic Provinces Harness Racing Commission. Our very own Gerard Smith joins us tonight, audio only from Summerside. Gerard, can you hear us? I can hear you clear. Yes. So, Gerard, we'd like to start off the show each week uh, with our guests. Uh, as you know, over the last number of weeks, it's been uh, quite the times here on Prince of Rhode Island. Uh, how are you and your, your family getting along over the past uh, number of weeks? Well, it's certainly been different. Uh, the wife says she's never seen me so often or I guess all the time. <laughs> I don't know whether that's a good thing or 
Well, exactly. I mean, a lot of people are uh, adjusting to the times for sure, Gerard. And uh, you've always kept busy. I know you, you play uh, sports on a regular basis. And of course, your work with us, our tracks, and not only that, other tracks around the Maritimes as well as we get back into a season. So we're looking forward to that. We're going to start off the interview process tonight, Gerard, uh, with our guests that are joining us on Facebook tonight, or maybe they're joining us on redshores.ca through the YouTube channel there. Um, first of all, how did you get interested in, in harness racing? Well, Lee, it's kind of a long story. Uh, I grew up about 13 miles on the other side of Charlottetown, Fort Augustus. And uh, we really didn't know anything about harness racing. You never heard tell of it. We did have a few horses around home, but, you know, cart horses, sleigh horses in the wintertime type thing. It wasn't until uh, a few years later when I played at St. Dunstan's for a couple of years and then played with Sandy's Royals in 64, 65, I believe it was. Uh, the next year, Sandy's uh, was a team in the Island League with Summerside, Borden, uh, RCIF, and uh, they real Sandy had two goalies, and Summerside was looking for one. So I decided to go to Summerside to play. Uh, Donnie Frizzle had come back to Charlottetown. He was a good goalie. He had been playing in Nova in the Nova Scotia Senior League. So. Rather than split games, I thought I'd go to Summerside and play most of the games. And it was my second year, and I played in Summerside for four years. So my second year there, Leighton Skierman, who was a coach at the time, said, or he informed me that uh, there was an opening for a school teacher at SIS, Summerside Intermediate. So I applied and, and, uh, I could interview between the first and second period of a hockey game on a Friday night in Summerside. So can you imagine Henry Clark, who was the principal, coming into the dressing room between the first and second. I get interviewed for the job, got the job, and started to teach the next year. The first guy I met when I went to the school was a custodian, Lester Jappel. And everybody knows Lester, a lovable character. And, and uh, it wasn't long after that that he had, a, had me out jogging horses, cleaning stalls, the whole works. And that's more or less how I get interested in harness racing, was through Lester Chapel. So we can blame Lester. <laughs> well, Gerard, that's quite a story. Um, you've been a race secretary for a long time. Gerard, I think you're approaching 50 years. You're at 48 now. Just tell us how you got involved in uh, that aspect of uh, the harness racing industry. Well, again, it was in Summerside, and, and uh, having been around the, the barn with Lester for a number of years, I, I believe I started as a race secretary in 72. Uh, somehow I got on the board of directors for the racetrack up there. There was, I think there was five or six directors, Bob, uh, Bob Doerr, Earl Cannon, Lester was on it, Harold Champion, myself, and there was a couple of others. But anyway, Red Sonia was the secretary at the time, and he took sick. And they were looking for a race secretary, and they couldn't find one. So I said, I'll give it a shot. And uh, that's how I became a race secretary. Again, we can blame it on Lester. It was him. You know, he always called me Smitty. Smitty, never Smith. But anyway, he said, he'll do it, he'll do it, he'll do it. So anyway, that's that's how I ended up as a race secretary. <laughs> Jerry, over to you. Cool. Oh, great stories, Stuart, on your start in the business. You even spent a little time driving back in those days before you uh, became a race secretary or Lester nudged you in that direction. Can you tell well, us a little bit about your on-track career? Yeah, it wasn't a very long career, Jerry. It was a, I think I drove maybe 25 races. Mm -hmm. But one particular race, Lester had two horses in the same race. And uh, he said, Schmidt, you can drive one and, and I'll drive the other. And when I, 
it was Lori J. Adios that I had, and she was a kind of a cantankerous mare. She was a puller. And I left on the inside, and I was supposed to let him go when he came. He had aisled the lead. And needless to say, when we hit the quarter, I couldn't get her back, and Lester was on the outside pounding, hitting knees and everything else. And uh, to make a long story short, we finished seven and eight, I believe, at the time. <laughs> so <laughs> it really didn't start as a driver all that good with Lester. <laughs> uh, Smitty, it's Kent here. Uh, just uh, each week when we're racing, uh, you put out condition sheets uh, for both our racetracks. Uh, can you describe for us what happens within the race office when from someone calls to enter their horses or now being able to, to enter online until the, the draw sheet is printed? Yeah, as you as you say, Kent, you have to put out condition sheets. It's quite a bit different now than what it was when I started in '72. It was more or less just make up seven races, eight races, try to make competitive racing. But now it's quite a bit different. You have your condition sheets. Uh, you try to manage. Everybody would like to have a start, at least a start a week. So you know, you put out your condition sheets and what we've done in Charlottetown especially is uh, race trotters and mares on Thursday, horses on Saturday, and it, it seems they've worked out quite well. Uh, as far as the trotters are concerned, you know, you have two or three that are dominant trotters. Uh, you have to try, every horse has to have the opportunity to race. So you try and, and uh, you know, make classes for the number of trotters that you have in there's there's three that you know are going to be in the top class or four and you have to try and come up with others that are possibilities the same with the top class for the horses you may only have three or four but you got to think of who else can i put in there or who else can i make available for that particular class so when you're writing your conditions you got to make sure that you have a couple of classes that might have to go in there and it's the same with the open mares. You know, you, whenever you have uh, mares that are dominant or horses that are dominant or trotters that are dominant, you got to try to protect yourself that you're going to be able to get them raced. So that's a big part of putting out your condition sheets. When it comes race day, or sorry, when it comes uh, draw day, uh, the declarations have to be in by 9 o'clock. Uh, what you do is you take all the, you take the declarations, you go through them, uh, you class like you classify them like a non-winner 551, uh, average per start, 110 per start, or whatever the case is, and you put that put that horse in that particular class, and then you go to the next one, you do the same thing. So what you have, what you basically then have, is maybe. Uh, 60 horses in 10 or 11 different classes, or you have 100 horses in 10 or 11 different classes. So then you try to follow the condition sheet as best you can. You know, maidens, winners one and two, winners three and five, uh, slow class, 301, whatever it is, 551, 701, and you go right down the line, and then from that you make your classes. Then you input them in the computer, and the computer will uh, preference them for you. Uh, Standard Bread Canada, they go back eight lines, and, and uh, you know anything back further than that, they're they're uh, picked by lot type thing. And that's what happens, you know, when you impute them in, or input them into the computer, you will tell them that you want eight horses, two also eligible for whatever, and it'll spit out that race. And basically, that's what you do for all the horses that you had that particular day, and it'll come out 10 races, 11 races, 12 races, whatever the case is. And if you have any other extras, then you have to input them under another condition, and and uh, when it comes out on the on the day sheet, it'll say that there's 150 entered and there's 100 and 
20 uh, input type thing in the in the races. So that's basically it. Gerard, uh, but having said, like to... having said that, it, it's there's a lot of work to it. Uh, I do a lot of preliminary work. Whenever they race on on Thursday night, I'll take a couple of hours or an hour and a half and classify that particular card. Same thing on Saturday. Same same thing on Sunday. So that when I go to the draw on Monday, I have an idea of what horses are in the top class, especially and who would be possibilities to fill classes. And I must say that the horsemen on PEI are pretty good. Uh, you know, you find, phone a guy, for example, Adam Erner's on there, you phone Adam, say, listen, I need a horse. Are you, uh, will you start him there? And he'll, most times he says yes, unless the horse is uh, crippled or dead, either one or the other. But there's other horsemen sure. too. Uh, the bigger stables. You know, Jared, I, I want to, uh, do, when you're on that uh, point as well, uh, can you talk about post position and how that's entered? Uh, you know, there's, uh, there's quite a procedure for that as well. Well, now, as far as the post position is concerned now, you just press draw and, and uh, the post position will come out. Now, that's if it's, if it's a straight race. If you've got a handicap race, then it, the computer will ask you what numbers are in one group, what numbers are in another group, and then you you group the horses in that particular group and uh, then press draw, and they'll come out that way. You know, two-year-olds you know, draw uh, inside. Kathy Carraher, you work uh, side by side with her for many, many years. I know she celebrated a birthday or will be celebrating a birthday shortly. So we'll send a little happy birthday wishes to her clerk of the course. You've I've worked uh, so close together. You've dealt with literally hundreds of phone calls uh, and messages just from horse people over the years. Uh, are there any uh, memorable calls that you'd like to uh, like to share with us? Well, there's all kinds of calls you get. Uh, yeah, put in them three of mine. And you don't know who you don't know who it is, really. Uh, and besides that, he doesn't have three; he's got seven. So you end up phoning him back and say, "Well, what three do you want in?" Or somebody else will phone in and say, "Yeah, but in the old gray mare or the old black horse or whatever." So you get calls like that all the time. Like uh, I guess they're as nervous when they when they uh, are on the phone putting their horses in. Some forget what. The names are and the whole works. But one particular time, uh, it was, uh, you know, you put your, your uh, phone on, on speaker and they phone in and they leave their messages. So one of these particular two old guys from the country, they phoned in and I'm going through, uh, you know, the phone taking off messages and comes to this guy and, and uh, I could hear his brother in the background. Is there anybody there? Yeah, I'm talking to the dummy. <laughs> so, so it was kind of comical at the time. <laughs> Gerard, we're gonna go to a race, uh, uh, the 2008 Gold Cup and Saucer, and I know it's a, it's a favorite of yours, but. I just wanted to know your thoughts about that race and the way it's set up and the way it finished. Did you ever dream of that as a classifier or see that happening uh, when they said go that day? Well, you know, you, you talk like you, I hear you guys asking different guys, you know, different drivers who their favorite horse is or owners who their favorite horse is. As a race secretary, your aim is to try to get a competitive race and any race it could be a non-winners of 301 or it could be a maiden race. If there are five or six horse at the wire, then, you know, that, that's a good race as far as the race secretary is concerned. That particular race was one of the best, but, you know, they were all right there. And I think the horse that finished ninth, if he had taken a different route, he might've won the race. And, uh, it was just an unbelievable turnout. No, uh, to answer your question, Peter, you wouldn't think, on that particular race that it would end up that way. 
Well, let's take a look at it, Gerard. Uh, interesting to get your comments heading in. We'll watch it now and we'll get your comments coming out. But let's watch the 2008 Gold Cup and Saucers. Van Cameron calls it the greatest of all time. 49th edition of the greatest Canadian horse race on a half mile track. Gold Cup and Saucer, market paid. St. Pete Star, match by Ama. Mighty and strong, positive, outlaw, positive charge, country estate, Mary, Matt, Hanover, Pottle Bay, Matt, in back, Banner, Yankee, it's showtime! There they go, they're off and pacing, firing up the rail, mock it, paid to the lead. Pacing a second into the turn, on the outside is Country Estate, Banner Yankee followed right through here. Round the turn, matched by Ahmed, dropped in to be fourth. Racing fifth on the outside, mighty and strong. Then in sixth, here nearly going, St. Pete Star, outlaw positive charge is seventh, Puddle Bay Matt is eighth, and Mary Matt Hanover trailing the field, Country Estate's lead, short-lived here, mock it paid said give and go time boom just like that 27 and one open it up here market paid and jean René punt back on the lead country has stayed at the rail no second banner yankee third and he's moving out now match by arm at the rail fourth mighty and strong in the outside now with some cover fifth puddle bay matt third over in the outside now six st pete start the rail seventh mary matt had on the outside now eight trailing the field Outlaw positive charge, 56 and 1. Opening half mile, turning to the back stretch. Second and final time, three quarter pole land. They're going there now in full flight here. Market paid, Banner Yankee, bridle to bridle, stride for stride, toe for toe. Puddle Bay Matt, joining them three wide, third, three quarters and one. Five and flat, eight of a mile to go. This is the greatest gold cup in soccer of all time. Down the lane they come. Puddle Bay Mount on the outside. Mary Mad Hanover up between them. Banner Yankee. Earl Smith, you've got it. Earl Smith wins the gold cup in soccer. Puddle Bay Matt has shocked them here at Charlottetown. 153 and four. Wow! Well, Gerard, that race there, uh, when you see it again, uh, and I know it was one in particular you keyed in on uh, for the show tonight, uh, but looking at it through the stretch, like you said, um, you know, the way it, way it all unfolded and just one of the greatest finishes. And not only that, uh, you know Earl Smith, you've been dealing with him for years, uh, for him to win that race that day and so many local connections on the finish line. That was special. Yeah, no, it was one of the better races. There was lots of movement in the race. Uh, you know, it was real exciting to see Earl Smith win the race. You know, he'd been around for a long time, tried to win it before, and, and uh, you know, it was great to see. I want to ask you but about it, you the know, in, Council of Atlantic. Sorry, go ahead. In that me. particular, no, in that particular race, too, they, they went in three and four, and most of those horses were competitive right around that, like two, three, two, two and a piece. You know, some of the uh, gold cup and saucers, governor's plates or whatever, you know, they're not always that every horse has a, an opportunity to win the race. And in that particular one, everybody had a chance to win the race. Uh, so, you know, from that point of view, uh, it was a terrific race. Uh, Gerard, you were also asked by the Council of Atlantic Premiers uh, to be part of a group to make recommendations uh, on harness racing in 90, 93 and 94. Um, I'd like for you to, to share the, with the audience uh, about that experience. Well, it was a real good experience, Lee. Uh, the, Maritime, the Council of Maritime Premiers at that particular time, uh, their aim was to set up a Maritime Racing Commission you had to remember that each province had a commission of their own. There was a PEI race commission, Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, the whole works. And also, uh, we were under USDA at that particular time, and, and the rest of the country was standard bred Canada. So <coughs> what we did, uh, there were three individuals from each uh, province, uh, Cyril Stead, uh, 
uh, Art Porter and uh, Phil Stead, I think, or Seal Ray from Nova Scotia. There was Harold DeCursey, uh Howie Trainer, and Mike Sullivan from New Brunswick, and P.I. There was Kent Oaks and, and uh, Wally Wood and myself. And uh, I ended up as the chairman. I don't know whether the rest of them didn't want it or they thought I was a rookie on the scene or whatever. So anyway, I ended up as chairman. But it was a real good experience. We went around the Maritimes uh, taking presentations for, from different bodies like Atlantic Sires, uh, Maritime Breeders, Island Breeders, each track, uh, and any other uh, group that wanted to make a presentation. And it ended up that, you know, we had one voice finally, one voice uh to represent the whole Maritimes. It was unification, really. And what it done, it really uh, led the way for simulcasting, uh, which every track has now. And it also got us involved with Atlantic Lotto, I think around 1997. So it was a good experience. Uh, it turned out that, you know, we had a uniform voice now and, and uh, I really enjoyed it. Gerard, um, we're going to just switch off uh, harness racing because um, I don't know if everybody knows that's watching tonight. A lot do, but we want to remind folks that uh, you're in the PEI Sports Hall of Fame and you uh, have had quite an athletic career. I'd just like to get your thoughts on uh, you playing on a couple of national championship teams, two in hockey, one in baseball, very decorated athlete on PEI. Tell us how uh, your athletic career got started, Gerard. Well, again, it's quite a long story. Uh, my mother was a school teacher. My father was a cheesemaker, and they weren't sports-oriented people. So anything that I did, I did it on my own pretty well. Uh, I have a lot to be thankful for because the guys in my community, uh, two of my cousins and a couple other guys that lived close by, really took me under their wing and, and uh when when they played hockey in the winter time in the evenings uh on ponds i was there but i played nets with my boots i couldn't i never skated till i was 15 or 16 as far as hockey was concerned and in baseball when i was nine and ten they were throwing balls at me and i was supposed to be the catcher and type thing and and uh i just learned either catch the ball or, or get killed. So uh, that's basically how my sports got started. I had no minor hockey, no minor ball. Uh, I remember my mother getting a, an old pair of hand-me-down skates. The back was all tore out of them. She took a darn needle and sewed them up with twine that you get at the store. And I remember going to the pond. There was a pond out in our field with a chair. I went to the pond with a chair, and I skated for about three or four hours, pushing that chair. And I went to play with the guys the next evening, and I skated. They couldn't believe it. It was something that I wanted to do. It was late in life, and maybe it was a good thing because I still play hockey. And, and uh, it was quite an experience. Uh, yeah, I was on two national championship teams in hockey. We didn't win in baseball. We, we finished second. Uh, we lost in the final to BC. And, and uh, But in our minds, it was as good as a win because we weren't supposed to be there. Uh, at that particular time when we left the province, uh, people said we wouldn't win a game. Well, we won five. And uh, we had an exceptional team and, and – uh, it was nothing but a great experience. Another big role you've played uh, in harness racing, Gerard, has been as a starter. Can you tell us a little bit about how that part of your career began and uh, the uh, <laughs> fulfillment you got out of doing that job? Well, again, it was in Summerside, and the starter didn't show up. And uh, 
they had no starter. The rate everybody was there ready to go, and they had no starter. So I bailed in behind, and that's how I got started. It was plain and simple. And I guess I did a reasonable, a reasonable job because he asked me to write my license, and I did, and passed, and you know ended up being a starter for about fifteen years. Mm -hmm. We're going to roll into a couple of photos here. I believe we have a photo of St. Dunstan's here. Uh, we do have quite an extensive uh, list of photos here, too, for you. Uh, Gerard, what do you remember about this one here? Well, that, that's back in 62, or 63, 64, I guess. Uh, back then, you didn't wear masks. Uh, you know, I, I can remember I was tall, skinny, and... Uh, that's about all I can remember about that. <laughs> it was the first year that Jack Kane, uh, well, in this particular, it was the second year that Jack Kane coached, and he had real good success with St. Dunstan's. We had a good team. We ended up first tied with UNB, but uh, they had beaten us twice. Uh, so the team that finished first would go on to represent the uh, AUAA at the Nationals, so we lost out. UNB went, but we had a very good team. Now that's well, Sandy shot Rose. Of you with the, yep. You won a couple yep, of Maritime Sandy. Championships. Yeah, in 64-65, we weren't in a league. We played exhibition games, and actually we played against the West German national team. Uh, they beat us 6-5, uh, sorry, 6-3. But it wasn't that bad because they went and played Boston Bruins uh, the next week, and I think the game ended up something like 2 nothing. So it was a real accomplishment for us. And, uh, folks, this is a, a shot from from uh, uh, Summerside Raceway with a uh, very young Jimmy Whalen and uh, Smitty on the right. I'm sure if Kathy and Tara were here, they'd say, you know, Smitty, you're still quite a, a snappy dresser. And uh, Yeah, did you see those were... pants? <laughs> so help me, God. Do you know where they came from? I don't know. I was in, Can I was in Canada Games in, in 69. It was the first Canada Games. And uh, I remember during the, the Gold Cup and Saucer Parade, I had to carry the flag. And you carry that sucker for seven hours or for seven miles or whatever the length of it was. It was it was tough going. But that was our dress. That was the pants. And uh, our jackets were green, uh, not even a nice green. So, uh, yeah, they, they were really flashy. That's Sandy Frizzle in the middle there. And... Uh, I can't say enough good things about Sandy Frizzle. Just a great sponsor. Uh, he owned the Royals. He treated us like pros. And uh, I got nothing but good things to say about him. Yes, an exceptional supporter of hockey and athletics and a great supporter of harness racing uh, during his lifetime for sure. Yeah, uh, so when yeah. Sandy... Yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah, uh, go ahead with Sandy. I think I know that uh, you and he got to be very good friends, Smitty. Yeah, well, he was he was a great supporter of racetracks on the island or anywhere that he happened to be. Uh, you know, back then uh, the tickets that you get weren't the same as what we get now. Uh, there were the little books of tickets, and Sandy would buy those things by the by the handful and every race he would wait until 10 or 15 seconds before the thing would shut off and any any uh ticket that wasn't sold he bought so there was never anything like a horse not having a win ticket on him because sandy had one for sure and uh he was just a terrific promoter uh off the hockey team but he was uh a real benefit to the racetrack. Uh, 
after four years in Summerside, I went back to play with Sandy's Royals in the Nova, in the New Brunswick Senior Hockey League. And we used to go to St. John, like if we were on a road trip, we would go to St. John on Saturday and uh, Fredericton on Sunday or St. John on Saturday, Moncton on Sunday, whatever the case was. But we would always go Saturday to go to the races in the afternoon. And that's when they were betting 110, 120,000 in the afternoon. A lot of Islanders were there. Alex McPhee was there. Uh, Lois McPhail, Wendell McDonald. Francis McIsaac was there. I think Earl Smith had horses there. So it was a real outing. And, and uh, you know, we'd go early enough to go to the races and uh, then play that night. I think next, Smitty, we have a picture from the uh, University of Prince Edward Island. He went back on sabbatical, I believe, to to play with uh, with uh, UPEI in 73-74. And if we could roll to the to the next photo, Scott, uh, the year previous, you had uh, joined up with the St. John Mooseheads to uh, play with the uh, uh, the Mooseheads there, and they went to the Hardy Cup and, and won the Hardy Cup that year, 1972-73. Uh, can you tell us about yeah. the experience of playing in a national hockey championship? Uh, quite an experience. Uh, that was 72-73. Uh, we were playing with the Royals. Uh, St. John beat us in the final. And there were three of us that were fortunate enough to be picked up. Uh, at that time, like a team from the Maritimes could pick up, I think, uh, four players. So they picked up from Charlottetown, uh, Link McKenzie, uh, myself, and Alf Handerhan. And they picked up Phil Dwyron from Moncton. Uh, the first uh, round that they played was against Ampui, Quebec. I wasn't there for that one. Uh, I think Link and Alfie might have been there. They used their own goalies, but they just uh, barely beat Amqui. I think it ended up, it was the best out of three, and they won two games to one. The next series was against Newfoundland. And they again they use their own goalies uh, and they beat Newfoundland two straight. Uh, the next series was against Embrum, Ontario, for the Eastern Canadian Championship. Uh, they it was the best out of three. They won the first game with I believe Ray Lapointe played. Uh, the second game they lost. Como played, and the third game. Dougie McVie was a coach, and he tapped me on the shoulder, and he said, you're going in the final game. And I hadn't had pads on for three weeks. I was a little rusty getting started, but they scored two or three on me early. But uh, we won our late, 5-4 in overtime, and went on to the final against Rosetown, Saskatchewan, who uh, Dave Schultz is from Rosetown. He didn't play, but. They had a very good team. It was for the national championship. Uh, they used their own goalie in the first game, but I played the last three, <laughs> and we won uh, three games to one. It was a great experience. Uh, it was pressure packed the whole way. Uh, the Lord Beaverbrook Rink in St. John was packed. They were hanging off the rafters. They were they were everywhere, and. Uh, to be in that situation was just a, it was real, real honor. Well, Gerard, we're gonna, we're gonna take you to a race uh, last year during Old Home Week. It was the 2019 Premier's Pace. And uh, Gerard, just going back to classification and we wanted to show this race tonight because as you mentioned, it really doesn't matter what type of race it can be. It can be a 551 like you mentioned or a 701 or preferred. We just thought this was a great example of classification and how close it was going to be. Plus, Vance had some great calls in this race. So we're going to show it and get your reaction now. So let's watch the 2019 Premier Space. And how's about Kaiwan? New driver. He's got an 800 percentage. Wow. Here's the eighth, the Premier Space. 
Rough and pacing and Rusty Riley leaping out. No play towards the rail. Third one to the turn. That is Pictonian Storm. Coming up fourth on the outside is Heartland Eclipse. Then on the turn fifth is Three Truths. Rounding the turn six. Dream on, dream on. And the trailer. That is Bank of Dad. They're quarter pole bound on the front end. Rusty Riley on the choo-choo by two for Paul Langell. No play away second. Third on the cones, Pictonian Storm. Then in fourth towards the rail, Heartland Eclipse. Into the turn, fifth is three truths. Then Dream On, Dream On, six. Trailing the field, that's Bank of Dad. A howitzer opener, 28 and one. Down the stretch they come, and the backfield well in motion now. Rusty Riley on the point. From the outside, here comes Pictonian Storm. Third at the rail, no play. Moving up fourth on the outside, Heartland Eclipse. Outside three troops, fifth. Up the rail in six. That is Bank of Dead. Now dream on, dream on the trailer. They were over to the opening half mile. Wow! 56 Four! They went 28 and three in the second quarter. On the back stretch, second and final time. Three quarter pole land going there now. Led by Rusty Riley from the outside, Pictonian Storm. Three wide! They're coming at them now. Out there, three deep is three truths. Heartland Eclipse between horses. In at the rail, no play. Three high, dream on, dream on. Three quarters in one. 25 and four. Set that camera up. We're going to need it. Rusty Riley from the outside. Three truths. Deep stretch now. And on the far outside. Dream on. Dream on. Oh, I love this game. We'll need a picture to separate them. Time for the mile one. 56. Flat. Well, here's the slow-mo, uh, Gerard. You're going to get a look at it here with the cable uh, cam that's going through the stretch here. And, uh, boy, this is really something else. We know we talked to Vance Cameron a little early this week to try to nail down this race because we like the calls on it. And Peter actually found it. What a finish here. That's got to make you proud as a secretary, as a classifier. Yeah, that's what I mean, Lee, when, when, when I say, you know, you, you don't get tied up and this was a special horse, this was a special horse. As a race secretary, you're trying to get a race exactly like that. And uh, when you see uh, that horse was last and, uh, you know, get up to win the race. Great shots there too, Lee, of uh, a lot of Cape Ritners. Uh, Premier King is there as well. And uh, really, really uh, uh, just a great race during Old Home Week and uh, really shows to where it's down and then putting that, that, that class together. Yeah, and, you know, when we're looking ahead to this year, uh, you don't know what's going to take place. But, you know, for us having an old home week without the people from Nova Scotia and New Brunswick, uh, it's quite a loss. You know, I'm not saying that they're not going to be here, but there's always that possibility. And they're a big part of old home week. Absolutely. Great shots there. Gerard, just quickly back on the hockey, I, I'd like to ask you a question read Gerard Gallant because I know you, you do have a great history with Gerard. Um, you had a successful career as a coach, but you coached Gerard as well. And then Gerard went on to have a great NHL career, as we know, and uh, has won Coach of the Year as well with Vegas. Um, just tell us about your relationship with Gerard as a player and uh, as a coach as well. Well, Gerard, I had Gerard in school as a student. Now, Gerard wasn't a great student. He, he was a great kid. Uh, but he, uh, as far as wanting to study, he wasn't all that interested, but a great student in class. I coached him uh, on a school team. We used to go to different tournaments around the Maritimes, uh, the intermediate school, seven, grade seven to nine. And <laughs> he played on that particular team, and he was a great player. When he was 12 years old as a peewee, he was playing Bantam. When he played, when he was Bantam, he was playing Midget. And then he got drafted in the Quebec League and, and uh, had a good career there. He, I believe he's in the Hall of Fame in the Quebec League and went on to the NHL. And, you know, as far as that's concerned, he had a great career there. Uh, in 94-95, when he 
finally retired uh, with Tampa Bay. He didn't want to go to Fort Wayne. I think it was that they were going to send him to. And he come home, and, and uh, I was coaching the junior team that particular year. And when he come home, I knew Turk real well, and, and uh, I just thought that he'd really be hurt and giving up his hockey, like quitting hockey. He, You know what, how it feels when, when it's no longer there for you. And I thought it'd be a great chance for to get him out on the ice and, and start getting him involved in practices and, and things like that. And he did. He decided to come out and he talked to the players and he really became one, like got along great with the players. They loved him. And uh, we ended up that year, we lost out to Amherst. But the next year, uh, I, I was there at the start of the year. There was uh, Turk, Jeff Squires, Ivan Bagel, I think was the other guys. And about five or six games into the season, I was still teaching school, and it was becoming more and more difficult for the coach. It was becoming more or less a full-time job and, and uh, to teach. And certainly I didn't want to ruin my teaching by not being able to do that. So I decided to uh, step down as coach. And I went to uh, Claire Sudsbury, who was a manager at the time, and I told him that I was going to step down. And he said, well, who are we going to get to coach? I said, don't worry, you got a coach already, uh, Turk. And uh, I hadn't told Turk, but anyway, <laughs> it ended up that he coached. Uh, and the next year, they won the Canadian, the Canadian Championship for – tier two and and uh from there he went on to uh, i believe columbus then he had a couple or two or three years in st john he was back to montreal for a couple of years and the rest is history florida vegas a great individual and certainly a good coach and uh you know i'm really pleased on how it turned out for him I think, Lee, we, we need your microphone there. Lee. Oh, sorry, guys. Yeah, I can't uh, hear you. Uh, there we go. Uh, Jerry and Kent, I just want to, before we uh, roll into the Hall of Fame section, is there uh, anything else you'd like to add uh, with Gerard? Well, just from my point, uh, Gerard, just uh, uh, it's uh, been been great dealing uh, with you all these years and look forward to many more. And, uh, and uh, just uh, congratulations on the recognition that uh, – you received a couple of years ago there. Bev and I were very pleased to be at the at the event when he went in the Hall of Fame, and it was certainly well deserved. Yeah, I, so I appreciate that, that photo there. Mm -hmm. There it is. Uh, there's the photo, Gerard, of the Hall of Fame, and uh, I just want to get your we want to get your thoughts on that. I mean, because the the story career you've had uh, to be in you know a Hall of Fame and get that call, uh, share with us uh, what that meant to you. Well, cer certainly it's a great honor to be in the Hall of Fame. Uh, you know, you, you look around at all the people that are there and, and you just hope that you're worthy to be there. You know, as you think yourself that you're good enough to be there and, and certainly when you're nominated and you get that call, it's, uh, it's pretty pleasing, really. Uh, there's quite a number of horsemen that are in there, like Clarkie Smith is in there, Roach. Uh, Francis McIsaac, Wally Hennessy, uh, George Kalbeck, Colonel Dan. So, you know, they're, they're elite people that are in there. And uh, it's certainly an honor to be in there as, as well. And, you know, I can't, other than that, I'm really pleased. Well, you know, um... You'll be back uh, soon with your role as race secretary and teaming up with Kathy again. And uh, also note the fact that uh, you've been at similar duties for tracks in Inverness, Nova Scotia, along with uh, Exhibition Park in St. John and Raceways in Fredericton and Woodstock, New Brunswick. And uh, even a manager of Summerside Raceway uh, stepped into those duties. You've had many roles, Gerard. And uh, also named Atlantic Province's Harness Racing Commission Official of the Year 
in 2016. It's something I know means a lot to you. It's been a pleasure to have you on the show tonight. Uh, it's not a lot of time that uh, times that we have a chance to talk to you outside of the hectic schedule that you keep. So tonight was was great to have you on the virtual attack room. Thank you very much. Yeah, getting back to uh, the race office, we got a good race office. Like Kathy Carragher is, there's nobody better. She's on top of everything. Uh, she'll pound you if you're not listening. And as Tara does a great job, you know, looking after uh, stall rent, uh, gold cup and saucer tickets, uh, allotting stalls for race day, whatever it happens to be. And, and uh, you know, it really, it takes everybody to work, to be doing, going and pulling the same line type thing. And uh, I'm really pleased with our race office. Thanks very much, Gerard. We look forward to having you back this season. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Gerard Smith, our, our special guest tonight in Virtual Attack Room. I know we're working with uh, Joy Power and Stanford Canada as well. The crew will be back uh, soon. And, uh, you know, uh, maybe some social distancing going on, of course, in the office area. But, but we're looking forward uh, to having them back. All right. So let's go to our, our next segment right now. And uh, when we talk about uh, special moments in careers, Boy, this guy's had a number of special moments, and we're going to walk you through a few of those tonight. And uh, we're just very glad to see and uh, have James McDonald on the show tonight, a successful driver in Ontario and, of course, from Prince Edward Island. James, good evening to you. Yeah, thanks for having me, guys. Glad to be here. Before we get into a few of the questions we want to ask, of course, over the last number of weeks, like many of our guests, how are you and uh, your family been uh, dealing with the time uh, off in the, in the last number of weeks uh, that's been happening across Canada and, in fact, the world? Oh, yeah, I've been okay. Just uh, it's getting pretty bored. Like the uh, It's a big change in routine for uh, for us, for sure. But, uh, you know, uh, we've been a lot luckier than some in Ontario because, obviously, my brother Anthony has a big stable, so uh, I've been in there every day and uh, help him out. So my girlfriend and I go in and uh, it... it kills half the day anyway or some of the day and then and then it's just netflix and playstation and whatever else you can do to get by drinking too many beer probably <laughs> uh, james uh the mcdonald name of course uh your your mom dad uh, the entire family of course uh, there's quite a history in, in in the sport of harness racing uh but take us through your involvement in your early years of how you get involved in this in this great industry well, to be honest, like uh, I'm sure most people know that no, but I, I had very little interest in horse racing. Like uh, as a kid, uh, we had horses at, at the farm at uh, Dad's place. But uh, aside from that, like you know, Anthony and Mark, they grew up in the in the backstretch, and they were you know they were doing anything they could to get their hands on a horse. And Curtis and I were just we weren't like that at all. Like we would just baseball, hockey, anything, you know. So. Uh, I worked at the canteen at the track for a few years, and uh, and I liked it, and I liked being there. I, I was actually working at the canteen uh, at the CDP when Mark won his first Gold Cup and Saucer, and I remember bolting out to the track. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I was always around it, but I, I never really had a whole ton of interest in it until I got older. Can you tell us... Uh... James, how you actually did get uh, started in the game and maybe reflect on your first pair mutual start and your first pair mutual win, what you can recall about those moments. Yeah, sure. Uh, to be honest, I, I'd probably still be in PEI if it wasn't for Anthony. I, uh, I was just finishing high school and uh, he was uh, just starting to get kind of big, uh, uh, big, oh, just one sec, I need to, Paige, can you get the charger for this? Yeah, sorry. Um, uh, yeah, I was just kind of starting to, uh, or Anthony messaged me, sorry. He was starting to get a bigger stable, and uh, and he just texted, or probably called then, and uh, and said, you know, he was looking for uh, me to come up and help him for the summer. You know, anyone that's uh, got older brothers they work with, they, they know uh, the family help is the cheapest, so... <laughs> So he got me to come up there. I, I got on a truck and trailer with uh, Johnny McKinnon and Gary McDonald, and 
and uh, headed up to Ontario. And I, I worked there in the summer. And uh, I'd like to say the rest is history, but it's not. I, I, you know, I didn't really have any fun. I didn't like it that much. So I moved back home and uh, I went uh, to Holland College for a year. And uh, I took marketing and advertising. And then the next year, he was Anthony was even bigger and he was dying. So he, he asked me to come back again. And I went back and this time I stayed like I, uh, I, I was lucky with when I went back the second time, uh, the following year, uh, he had he had a great uh, mentor for me uh, was Jamie Smith. Uh, everyone knows him back home. He trains horses there. But he was Anthony's head trainer. And and he like kind of took me under his wing. And, you know, a Anthony was great as well. He taught me lots. But I mean, anyone that's worked with Jamie Smith, like he, uh, he had me up real early and, uh, you know, he taught me how to do things right. And, and, uh, and, you know, he gave me a, a good work ethic. Like he, uh, if you, if you weren't, uh, anyone that's worked with him, if you, if you're not doing your job, he's one of those people, he won't yell at you or scream at you, but he'll do your work and make you feel bad for it. So, uh, yeah, it was great working with him. And then, uh, he, you know, him and Anthony, they kind of pushed me towards training and, and driving. And, uh, from there, I think I had my first paramutual start. It was in August. Uh, it was right before old home week. And I, uh, I drove a horse at Georgian Downs and I, I finished fourth. I can't remember the horse's name right off the top of my head, but, uh, then I went to PEI and and uh, that's where I got my first win. So that was it was real special for me and I it was a lot of fun. Yeah, James, it's Kent here. When we look through your your career stats, which are you know extremely uh, impressive, in two thousand nine you had one hundred and three drives and six wins, and then it was just like a meteor from there on. Next year eighty six, and then two hundred and forty seven wins into your third. Uh, uh, career our third year of driving and you know to 316 and it's you know been at, at that level with uh, you know uh, three and a half million or more each year in earnings um, for someone who you know, as you say didn't have an interest from a young young child you certainly developed uh, uh, and, and had a, a great natural ability as a driver uh, that showed up very early in your career yeah, I, I had I had a lot of good people, like I said, helping me, and they were always, you know, really supportive and and uh, you know pushing me to drive. And and then it, like like I said, when I started working with Jamie Smith, it started to to click. Like I didn't, it was in the blood. It just took a little. It was dormant, we'll say, and uh, it took a while to kick in. But uh, when it did, you know, it, it came on. I'd like to say it came on quick, and I was a natural. But I mean, I I don't know how many times that first year or into the second year, I was like. Uh, you know, geez, I don't got it, or I'm not good enough, and uh, you know, maybe I, you know, maybe I'm not meant to drive, and so I always, I always tell people that are just starting out, or people, especially from PEI, if they, if they'll message me or or uh, ask me about driving, I'm always like, you know, stay at it, believe in yourself, and uh, you know, because I, I just took one horse, I, I, I started driving a horse named Astraline for uh, David Fry. And she, every week, you know, she'd come screaming on the end or I'd be first up and she'd gut it out and win or, you know, you could drive her anyway. And I think I drove her like nine or 10 weeks in a row and she never, never missed the top three. And then it just, I started picking up a few more and a few more and, you know, I just kept the drives I was getting and it just started snowballing and, and it worked out great too. Like the people who liked Mark, but didn't like Anthony put me down and the people who liked Anthony and didn't like Mark because there were lots of them on both ways. So I, I right off the bat, I kind of got both of them because they're two huge personalities. There's not, there's not too many people that don't like both of them. <laughs> James, just, just to pick up on that, um, who are some of the owners and trainers that sort of gave you a break and gave you some nice horses in Ontario? It's hard to, to pinpoint just a few. I, I mean, obviously, uh, Mark and Sean Stacy the last few years have been uh, like just massive for me. You know, they have such a big stable and, and so many good horses and, you know, the the best people in the world to drive for, you know, no pressure and and just uh, just class acts. You know, I can't say enough good about them. And, uh, you know, my family, all the people from PEI when I when I started driving, you know, anyone anyone from the East Coast would always you know, put me down because they want to see, you know, you know what guys know what people from back home are like. They want, 
they want to see the young Islander do good or they want to, you know, so I had, I had a lot of help and, uh, I can't pinpoint one owner or trainer or anything like that. But I, you know, there was a lot of people like I'd be talking all night if I was trying to thank everyone that, that helped me along the way. Well, we're going to get you back to the racetrack here. And, uh, certainly James, uh, a win in 2015, which was uh, just an incredible win at that time. And, uh, we have a few with on the show tonight, but, uh, take us back, uh, about the 2015 Milton stakes, uh, with, uh, Venus delight, uh, your thoughts going into that, uh, that big race. It, that's actually a good story. Uh, Venus delight because, uh, Jeff Baymond had messaged me, uh, on Facebook or something. And I was driving a, a couple for him every now and again, he would send up here and, uh, he, he'd messaged me and, and asked me to drive, uh, the great mayor Andrew bet. And I was like over the moon, you know, like, Oh my God, I'm going to, I'm going to sit behind Andrew vet. Like, you know, what an honor. Like, so uh, he said, I'm going to have two for the race and, uh, Jason Bartlett's going to come up and drive, uh, Venus delight. So, uh, I think the draw came out or whatever happened. And uh, he messaged me through the week and he said, uh, geez, he said, uh, Jason Bartlett isn't going to make it up. Uh, who do you think I should put on Venus Delight? So, uh, like, I thought about it for a minute and, you know, being the greedy person I am, I messaged him and I was like, you know, Venus Delight's like right on top of her game right now. Uh, I, would you mind if I drove Venus Delight and we could find someone else to drive Andrew Vett? And he was like, He's like, oh yeah, yeah. I just, you know, I, I did whatever you think. Like, I whoever you want to drive is no problem. And you know, I, I, my stomach churned, and it was 20 minutes before I knew what I was going to do, or if I was actually going to ask to not drive Andrew Vet. And, uh, and you know, it was one of the best decisions I've made. And uh, I was, you know, just lucky that he was so understanding. And he's, you know, I was just worried he was going to say, yeah, you don't want to drive her, and you know, don't drive any of that. <laughs> but. Uh, it worked out great and uh you know the rest is history as they say well let's watch the race now james and we'll get your comments after this but here's a big win for uh, james mcdonald the 2015 milton stakes with venus delight here they come they're often pacing lady shadow leaves so does precocious beauty from the inside andrew vet is chased out of there driving into the first turn no one could match the early speed of precocious beauty as she charged to the front outside prompting her now here comes parked out driving lady shadow andrew vet fills up that precious pocket real estate fourth towards the inside you gonna kiss me or not so the opening quarter rings up in 26 flat lady shadow found the front Precocious Beauty from in second now. Andrevet sitting just off the speed inside third. You're going to kiss me or not fourth. Venus to light is fifth now. Sixth inside to sand between your toes. Final three are Colors Virgin, followed by American in Paris. Last, as Katie said. Cross the back stretch. They're still single file. No action at all from the backfield. That is until Jameson right line. You're going to kiss me or not. As she's first over on the way to the midway point. Lady Shadow leads through a 54 and 4 half. Precocious Beauty's in the pocket position from in second. You're going to kiss me or not advancing now chipping away first over third in at the rail fourth is andrew vet on cover venus delight from in fifth now sixth outside sand between your toes she's in a flow that's not advancing shooting through up the rail katie said picks up positions until she finds a blind switch then it's back to colors of virgin and last is american in paris Fired to three quarters, Lady Shadow in one, 22 and three. She revved up 27 and four in the third quarter, and she brings them into the stretch. Lady Shadow on top by two open lengths now. Second at the inside, Precocious Beauty. You're gonna kiss me or not is third. Now rolling on the outside with late speed comes Venus Delight. Even wider sand between your toes. Tight finish coming up here. Lady Shadow still there. Venus Delight on the outside is coming on. McDonald and Venus Delight to win the Milton in 150 and 1. James, when you see that race again now, obviously uh, one of the biggest ones of your career at that time. Um, uh, what memories come back to you when you when you see that? Uh, you must have watched it a few times, I, I suspect. <laughs> Yeah, more than a few. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I just, I remember that night, like, and, you know, you just get, it's the same now. I've won a couple of big races and you, it's just, you're so focused on the race and you're so, uh, you know, in the moment that when you hit the wire and you're first, it's just like overwhelmed with joy. And it's, you know, there's nothing, 
a any driver will tell you there's nothing like winning a race, but winning a big race is it's just something else. Like it's it's special. You get to drive regularly against the top drivers in Canada on the Ontario WEG circuit, uh, James, and to get calls to drive the top horses when the uh, Grand Circuit and stake races come to the, come to town must be pretty special. Tell us what it's like to uh, drive night in and night out against the best. Uh, it's, it's a good bunch of guys, really. Like uh, I always say, you know, people are always talking about their job and talking about their job. And I, you know, I just, I can't say enough good about driving horses and I'm very thankful. This is what I get to do as a profession because I get to go work and, you know, we have a great time in the driver's room. The guys laugh and joke and we tell stories and torture each other. And, you know, it's, it's, it's just fun. It's, it, it's a lot of fun. And then, you know, and when we get on the track, everyone can turn it off and, you know, we're, we're all competitive guys and, you know, there's there's no favors out there, and it's just they're they're so professional, and you know a lot of you know sometimes you get in someone's way, and you know they can turn the page, and you know it's they know they know you're not out there to you know do it on purpose, but when you're competing for that much money at a at a high level, it's just you know it's just gonna happen. It's just one of those things, and uh, you know the guy the guys are great, the racing's you know the racing's great, and. Uh, I'm just happy to be out there with some of, uh, like you said, some of the best drivers in the world, and and uh, you know it's it's just fun everywhere we go, and I'm a you know really really lucky to to be there. The next race we're going to look at, uh, James, is the uh, uh, Canadian Pace and Derby final, and uh, you had of course had Courtly Choice in that race. Courtly Choice was coming off of. Um, uh, first to the second in the preferred classes in uh, Woodbine to heading into that race, including winning in 49 flat, the last quarter 26 and three. But uh, he was in that race. It was an exceptional group of horses. Did you think that Courtney Choice was getting the recognition that he deserved uh, heading into that uh, Canadian Pace and Derby race? Yes and no. I mean, uh, like. I'd love to just say, yeah, oh, I thought he'd be one to nine, you know, but it's just not true. <laughs> like you, you'd lather up just coming off of 46 and whatever, when like with the brakes on, like he'd been just like, not just winning, like destroying good horses, like the best horses. So, so yeah, I, I didn't think he should have been as long odds as he was because he was sensational that when he came back to Canada, like Blake had him amazing. His, uh, the start, I put him on the front. He just like, toyed with good horses and then the next week honestly scotty just flat out out drove me like he put me in a bad spot and and uh, i end up i was kind of in between moves and and i come first up slow but the horse paced hard through the wire and and i never pushed him i knew he had you know bigger fish to fry coming up and uh so jimmy freight got the better than that night but i like when you're dealing with special horses like those like trip is everything like because they're all incredible animals you know and uh you know i was just the race worked out great you know it kind of went how i thought it would and you know obviously i i would like to say i knew i'd run down uh lather up down the lane but he's just so untouchable at the moment i was hoping when i moved him i was hoping to be second and it just it was it was a crazy night and uh you know it was just worked out amazing Let's set up that race a little. Uh, $525,000 Canadian Pacing Derby last August 31st. As James mentioned, Lather Up was coming into the race. Uh, he was the favorite. He had won in 46 flat in the final of the Graduate Series at the Meadowlands, tying the world record and setting a world record for four-year-olds. Also in that field was defending Horse of the Year and the 2018 Canadian Pacing Derby champ. Meg Wicket and David Miller, they drew the nine hole that night, but uh, he was on the way to repeating his age pacer of the year. We also had Jimmy Freight and uh, Scott Zeron, top four-year-old. Ron Burke had three horses in there. This is the plan with Yannick Jindra on the rail, done well for Andrew McCarthy, 
and Phil Buster Han Hanover for Tim, Tim Dietrich. Dr. Ian Morris, Casimir Richie P was in there with Sylvain Pillion. Western Fame with Louis Philip Bois. Uh, Courtly Choice had won three of 11 that year coming in off his top free roll season when he won both the Merit, uh, Meadowlands Pace and the Little Brown Jug. It's the top three year old in the business in 2018. A uh, little disappointing, three for 11, making that adjustment to the four year old complaint campaign. But like James said, he was real sharp with his uh, two starts in Canada before and set up for just an amazing race with uh, 25 and change quarter on the end of it to uh, upset the field. Just incredible. It was a great field, Jerry. And uh, James, we're going to get a look at the race here now. We'll get your reaction after, but uh, this was some night for James McDonald, the 2019 Canadian Pacing Derby. Courtly Choice wins it. Here they come. There, off and pacing speed from the rail. This is the plan. Fires. So does Jimmy Freight, splitting the pair of them done well. Lather up will size them up in between horses into fourth now. Then it's back inside to Western Fame. McWicked left for position off the gate. Then it's back to Courtly Choice and Filibuster Hanover and Casimir Richie P. The opening quarter coming up, this is the plan, is ask Jimmy Freight to take a seat. Right there, third, done well. Lather Up's on the gas pedal now. Quarter speed of 25 and 4. And they go into the back stretch. So Jingra wanted to ensure that he got a pocket trip behind Lather Up, and here is Lather Up sprinting to the front. Into the pocket position. This is the plan to 3 eighths. Jimmy Freight is third, done well, fourth, fifth inside to Western Fame. McWicked back in sixth, seventh, courtly choice. Further back, we go to filibuster Hanover and Casimir Richie P, a single file trailer on up to the midway point. Pacer single file at the half in 54 and 1. That's how much respect Lather Up gets. Lather Up goes into the final turn and he had them lined up at the half. This is the plan of second. Jimmy Freight is third. Dunwell is underway fourth outside now as McCarthy hits the gas pedal. Back into fifth as they pace the turn is Western Fame. So they're coming after Lather Up here. Outside pressure from Dunwell. Right there from in third. Boy, is this is the plan. A handful for Jingrice climbing over Tegan Lather Up to the outside from fourth is Western Fame. Jimmy Freight escapes off Pylons fifth. Three quarters in one, 22 and one. So Lather Up survived that final turn. He comes into the stretch now, gets a slap of the wheel disc here from Teague. Lather Up is still there. He's put away Dunwell. Dunwell on the outside into second. Now up off cover comes Western Fame. Roaring up from way back. Could it be Courtly Choice playing giant killer? Courtly Choice sets sail. And it's Courtly Choice with a stunning upset in the Canadian Pacing Derby. 148 and four courtly choice at 34 to one well james i hope you have that photo somewhere gigantic what a great shot that is right there uh with that uh, with that win that day I i'm interesting when you look at that you know you were close to the to the back of the pack uh, when you came heading into the stretch but Blake said something in the interview after that really gave you a lot of credit. He said, James took care of this horse and uh, really felt that the horse was going to put in a big performance that night. Is that a fair assessment? Yeah, I mean, I, it was just something about that horse. You know, I, I jumped on him, uh, trained him back at three for Blake. And he, and he had a good two-year-old year. year. He, he set a track record at uh, Saratoga, I think. But I, ne I never drove him, but I, uh, I actually I qualified him at two late in the year, and he just wasn't sharp. Like he got kind of beat up a couple times and whatever. So at three coming back, uh, you know, I didn't think he was a champion or anything. And uh, Blake had asked me to go over and train his babies, and uh, and I trained him one day, and he was just like, whoa, like a crazy good. And uh, I remember I we, there was close to qualifying three-year-olds back and Jody Jameson had asked me, he said, oh, do you, do you have any good three-year-olds coming back? And I said, I don't know how good this thing of Blake's is. I said, but he's been like training and schooling, like unbelievable. And then I qualified him. He was amazing. His first start, he went in like 50 and then he went down to uh, Vernon and Dave Miller won in like 48 flat with him or something. Uh, and there, you know, and then he went on to have an amazing three-year-old year, the, the pacing or the uh, Meadowlands pace and the jug, and just an amazing animal. But uh, you know, we, we just always got along good, and he was kind of a funny horse to drive. Like, uh, 
some nights he'd want to bust out of the gate and some nights he was just kind of like kind of float out of there on his own and and you know he always had to have him on his toes but then he could get too sharp but if you didn't have him on his toes he could be too lazy like he was just kind of a finicky horse and and going into that race he had uh you know like i'd said he'd won in 50 on the front and like i mean never or uh no I, maybe he's 49 on the front but he uh like never broke a sweat like and i mean pacing away from like open horses like made them look like like they were nothing so he uh i, I was super confident in him and like i said when scotty uh, beat me with jimmy freight the week before it was just tough trip i knew i wasn't going to beat him and i never pushed him and i kind of thought going into the race if if, if i can get a helmet because he he came off a helmet just like a bullet like he'd give you that big move and then when you pulled the plugs it was just airborne and and you know it kind of kind of worked out like um uh, the cover was good when Dave dropped back in with McWicked. Then, uh, you know, Andy, Andy lather up, always stalled a little bit in the last turn at, at uh, the Meadowlands and, and Mohawks just a tiny bit tighter. So he, uh, he was kind of struggling through the turn. And then when he took off, I was just setting sail and it was just like a sprint from there on. Like, so when I moved him, it was, you know, a great feeling. I was like, I'm getting a real good chunk of this, but I'm still expecting lather up to, you know, explode. And halfway down the lane, I was like, you know, I got to run at him here. Like it's, it's going to be a good race. And, and, and then I just, I just, it was like an overwhelm with emotion. Like I was so, so pumped up and the, the fist pump and the pitcher, I, like you said, I have a giant one <laughs> right over the couch in the living room. And it's, it's probably one of my favorite pitchers of all time. And I, you know, it will, like I even watching that replay, I watched it the other day and uh, just that fist pump and like the, the big woo after it's it's like my favorite shot of all time and uh you know it's a special horse and a special memory and uh you know it's just uh, I, li I like talking about it i don't know if you can tell <laughs> <laughs> well rightfully so the 2019 canadian pacing derby uh, courtly choice james mcdonald just a, an awesome memory there and a, and a photo keepsake for sure speaking of photos we're gonna roll into our next segment here with the photo parade and we'll be back with James McDonald. Adam Murner is coming up uh, on the back half of the show as well. But right now, it's the photo parade here on the virtual tack room. And it's brought to you by McRae Backhoe and Trucking and McRae Racing. Head back to 2017 in the final leg of the World Drivers' Championship, captured by James McDonald, first Canadian to ever win on home soil. Here we have the 11 participants in that uh, competition from all around the world gathered at the historic judges' stand. You uh, get to be good friends with these lads as you traveled across the country, James, for the five legs of the uh, World Driving Championship that year, no doubt. Oh yeah, it was just a, like a, another great bunch of guys. Like uh, we started in Calgary, and uh, we had fun everywhere we went. Like uh, and just instantly uh, became friends, and we did everything together. And they brought buddies kind of with them over on the trip, and became friends with them. And uh, you know, I like I still I still talk to Marcus and Dexter all the time, and Yarn a little bit. Like when I see him do well in Sweden, and uh, just a terrific bunch of guys and and uh, we like a, we, we were at like a kind of the same as what i said about the driver's room like we were all trying to win and super competitive but you know at the same time whoever won you know we were happy for them and uh, cheering each other on and uh you know they they were they were just like a great 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 crew and uh it was a great experience I'd like to know, James, um, you know, that schedule, uh, for those of us who are, you know, following along with the schedule from track to track uh, and the competitions, um, what was that like? What type of schedule was it? Because uh, I'm not sure if how many people know just how how much territory you guys 
traveled in, in a short period of time? Well, it was it was overwhelming how much we did. Like it was, they had us up early in the morning, you know, out like we'd go see farms or go on tours, and then you know we got to the track super early. Everyone had to get licensed, and then uh, you know we'd meet a few people, whatever, and then race and. And then after the race, everyone wanted to have, you know, a couple drinks or go out and have a good time. But then, boom, we were back at it, you know, 6 or 7 o'clock in the morning the next day. Uh, anytime anyone asks me, like, oh, how, how, geez, it's been a while since you've been home. I'm like, yeah, it's, it, like the last year I was home, I drove, I consider, was was up, was up in the Gold Cup and Saucer. And I haven't been back since because that trip, I don't even think I got to see my mom and dad more than just, you know, a couple of hellos or in the winter circle after. But like it was just like overwhelmed and then and we the friday night we raced and uh saturday morning i had a 5 a.m flight back to uh, ontario there were golds at mohawk so i didn't even stay for the gold cup and saucer and you know i just <laughs> i i've been itching to get back home and my girlfriend Paige and i we actually uh, those flights came out on swoop this year uh, cheap early so we booked for this old home week there were no stakes and then boom <laughs> COVID 19 so i don't know if we'll make it back or what's the story on our flights but we'll see we'll see i guess yeah folks i guess uh, uh we should uh, have some recognition here of just uh, about the the 2017 world driving championship and how we got it we were uh, we had written to, on behalf of Standard of Canada, I wrote to the president of the Swedish uh, Horse Federation and asked to swap. Uh, it was Sweden's turn to host in 2017, but we knew that we were going to have some some federal provincial money around the uh, the 2017 year. So we asked to, to swap positions with them, and they were gracious enough to do that. And that happened because of the support of three ministers that we certainly dealt with uh, throughout that time as ministers responsible for racing, Wes Sheridan, Robert Mitchell, and Heath McDonald. I just want to recognize those gentlemen's contribution to be able to host uh, the 2017 World Driving Championships and the, and the World Trotting Congress. Uh, James, this is a shot of, uh, of course, yourself and Jillian Doucette at the introduction of the um, drivers for the 2017 uh, competition. James, how, uh, how much uh, uh, ability did you have to to uh, interact with the trainers and find out about the the four horses that you were going to be driving on that last uh, and final leg of the competition? Um, not a, not a lot. I mean, obviously, I, I drove one for Mike McGuigan. I've known him since I was a kid, so it was, that was easy. I you know we were talked over messenger or whatever, but uh, the others it was just as kind of the same as everywhere else. We just went and uh, saw them before the race, talked to them, and. Uh, uh, apparently, I didn't get enough information because I got my butt kicked in PEI. <laughs> but, uh, but uh, you know, it was it was no different than anywhere else. It was just kind of you know a couple couple minutes. You know, I hear how how's he seem. You know, what's he like? What's he doesn't like? What what does he not like? And uh, and that was it. James, this shot here is is a great shot. How important is it for you to interact with fans uh, in the, in a competition like this? Well. You know, like I, I told most people, that was like to finish in PEI, like you couldn't write a better story than that. Like everywhere I went, like it was, it was jam like the parade, they were cheering. Like I've never heard people cheer like that for a person, like, like for myself anyway. Like they go crazy every time they said my name, every time I jog in front of the grandstand, that would just erupt uh, ever. The whole crowd was in white and red, and it, like it was. I just never thought it'd get like that, you know, like it, I, I knew it would be like a cool to win it at home and I had a big lead and it was special. But I mean, the, the uh, reaction I got was mind boggling and, and uh, you know, I, it was it was wild. I, I, I mean, I loved that night interacting with the fans. I mean, most most nights when <laughs> if I, you know, I'm at Mohawk, I'm probably getting heckled more than I'm getting cheered on. So. <laughs> It was uh, it was pretty special to have the whole audience, you know, no matter who they bet on, they, the back of their heart, they were, you know, they were rooting for me. And, you know, people from school I hadn't seen in years were there. And, you know, all my, my good friends from, from back home, my family, it was it was just really special. And there's a great chat there's with a your couple mom, of great James. Thoughts there. Yeah, oh yeah. Anthony was so happy and mom was so happy and dad, you know, it was just – 
you know, you usually uh, I, back home, I, I, anytime I go home, I'd get, oh, there's James, Mark's brother. So it was nice to, uh, nice to, uh, to be, uh, mom and dad were, were, had their chest stuck out, uh, pumping my tires all week. That was for sure. Yeah, I think you said it best, uh, James, when uh, there's a look at the uh, the celebration there. And I, I really think you did say it best when you couldn't re write a script any better coming home to Prince of Rhode Island, all your family and friends here. Um, and uh, for those who weren't, they were, you know, tuned in. We set a record that night with it was just a perfect night too. the weather was perfect. The crowd was was into it. And um, certainly just one of those moments that, uh, you know, we as all Islanders and, and Canadians uh, were so proud of you then. And um, to wear that suit, too, um, I mean, that must have been something every time you put that on to step on the track, that must have been quite a feeling with that Canadian suit on. Yeah, I mean, it, it felt great right from the get go. I mean, I just I never thought I'd like myself in red, but uh <laughs> It, it felt great and you know I got off to a good start and then it just it kept getting better and better like you know obviously going in it was just I was just honored to be there and hoping to you know not embarrass my country or my family or whatever you know so uh, I you know to, to do well and then when it started getting near the end and I was like Gee, you know I got a big shot at this it was you know I, when I put it on in PEI I felt like Superman like it was it was uh, like something I I can't ever compare anything to that, and I will. You can't. It just doesn't get better than that. Go back home and and uh, win it in front of your uh, family. Uh, like my mom and dad, they were so proud, and you know I just was happy to do it for them. And you know all my friends and family. It took me 20 minutes to get to the tent uh, after. Like just you know everyone was just shaking my hand and congratulating me, and you know ever it was just really special. James, uh, just like to ask you, uh, you, uh, you, the World Driving Championship, huge win for you in 2017. You've won some big races, but are there, is there a signature race out there that you'd still love to win? Is is the Gold Cup up there for you? Oh yeah, <laughs> definitely. I uh, I think if you ask anyone that knows me well, uh, getting beat uh, that year with was up was up right at the wire was probably as down a moment on the racetrack as I've ever had. Like I tell people, you know, if, if I'm second in the any big race, you know, it's, it's still a good payday. Like, you know, you're happy and whatever, you know, you, you have regrets and you say, oh, maybe I could have done something different or maybe I could have won, but I mean, second through ninth in the gold cup and saucer is the same to me. It like nothing. It, it's, if you don't win, then it's all the same. Like, uh, especially I've done it a few times now and I, it's, it's as high on my bucket list as you can get. Like, uh, like I said, I was so, crushed after I got beat with uh, what's up was up I didn't you know I was happy to get out of there after and just just get get back to Ontario and forget about it because it was you know it was right in my turning for home I'm on top in the gold cup and saucer I hadn't missed one you know since I was a kid and and it was just it was right there and it slipped through my fingertips and uh you know I was happy to see Brad win obviously he's a great guy and uh you know it was a great race for everyone watching it just didn't end up the way i wanted to so so gold cup is i'm, I'm gonna get it <laughs> i'm gonna at least try until i can't try anymore but i'm i'll be back and uh hopefully have a good shot at it and uh, other than that i mean i'm the same as every other driver in the world uh, you, the hamiltonian you know north america cup little brown jug you like you those are just you know anyone that drives a horse aims for those races and uh you know i would you know the bigger purse the better you know that's great too but the hamiltonian like i said little brown jug na cup metro something like that would be really special but to me like uh it's the gold cup and saucer it doesn't get any bigger than that and uh it would be a proud day and i'd be pretty uh it'd be pretty tough to top that for an island boy and uh do it like in front of my friends and family so hopefully in the next few years you'll see me hoist that trophy james uh there was a, a filly that uh, started her career uh, she was an island uh, fold filly bred by doug mcphee of new haven uh, was trained here by tommy weatherby and driven by mark bradley and then moved on to ontario in 2019 and um had a, a remarkable uh, 
2019 season, earning $227,000. And I know you drove her uh, on occasion in 2019, but you've also driven her to uh, several wins in the Phillies and Mares Preferred. And that is, is of course, so much more. Uh, can you tell us about uh, uh, so much more and, and just how, how well she's done when she's uh, hit the WEG circuit? She's been unbelievable. Uh... I drove her brother Ty Lamaro when he came up here, and and you know he's a nice horse, and I liked him, and he made some money, and you know I he, he was he was nice, and then when so much more come up, I remember her second start. I didn't see her in London, but uh, uh, Trevor Henry drove her out of the ten hole in a grass route at Mohawk, her second start, and uh, I remember I had one for Mark uh, Sean Mark and Sean Stacy. It was uh, Freya Sealster. And I thought I had a good shot to win, and you know I was three or four to one or something, and I ended up making front. I let Trevor go out this so much more, and I'm thinking, oh, when we get down the lane, I'll just blow the doors off this thing. Like my horse, she was pretty nice, and we turned for home, and I was like all out. And this, like, I'm looking up, like, how is this little thing still going? Like she's just gone. Like, and and I think I ended up like fourth or third, and like she just ripped my heart out, like just drew off, and like 51 or 50 or something. I was. It was crazy. So then uh, she went down to uh, Clinton. You know, I, mean, I think she was first or second in the Kin Pace. And then, you know, she just, if it was any other year, I mean, she would dominate up here. But it was just a tough, tough uh, division. You know, powerful Chris and uh, Bill Budd's Philly and and uh, just just so many of them. Like, it was, it was a deep, deep field. And... Uh, so she ended up, they put her in the grassroots and, and she destroyed them in the grassroots semifinal and final. And then, uh, yeah, I was lucky enough to get to drive her a little bit late in the year. I picked her up and she was everything I could imagine, like seeing a race. And, and then she kind of like got extra good, like late, late this year in the, or late in 2019 in the winter. And she'd worked her way up to the open. And, and I remember I raced her one time and, uh, I'd come like flying on the end of it and I was right there so that the next time I drove her in the Phillies and Mares preferred and, and anyone that knows Don beats and he's probably one of the nicest human beings alive. Like he's just a, you know, old time horseman and just, you know, always happy, always in a good mood. And I remember I said to him before the race, I said, uh, I said, uh, have you ever won the, the, uh, the, the preferred here, uh, Don? And he goes, no, you know, he said a couple nice horses. He said, I, won the backup class with maybe monster in law. And I said, well, you better go do your hair up. I said, cause we're going to win the preferred tonight. And she just like destroyed them, like just come off cover like a rocket. And then, uh, she, she won a couple more opens on both ways, front end, back end didn't matter. First up, uh, she's just tough as tough. And, uh, so then they, they moved her into the, to race against the boys. And then the, the, I don't know, 10 years or eight or nine years I've been racing at Mohawk, I've, I've really never seen a filly race against the boys. So uh, they'd moved her and Kendall Sealster up, and Kendall had won the uh, preferred boys once. So, you know, we were, we were kind of slugging it out every week, and I thought, you know, if she can just stay, keep you know, keep her brave, and then when she drops down into the, against the girls, she'll win again. And then, sure enough, she got, she got a good trip one night, and she just smoked the boys and then smoked the boys again like she – like she's not just a, a nice little filly, like a nice little mare anymore. Like she's doing things like, you know, and everyone cheers for her because she's just this small little horse and she doesn't move a muscle in the paddock and, you know, everyone loves her and, and sees her. And, and when she comes off cover, it's just like, she's a freight train. Like she can fly and uh, she's had a great year so far. And uh, you know, she's got a little break with this and hopefully she comes back fresh and, she, I know she's paid into a few stakes, so hopefully we can have some fun with her and uh, finish the year out strong. James, uh, just before we let you go, um, a question for you. If there was a match race between you, Anthony, and uh, Mark, who wins that race? Oh, well, uh, there's a few ways to answer this question. <laughs> well, right now, I mean, Mark Anthony's focusing on the stable and training horses. He drives, you know, a little bit still and uh, does well. And But Mark's just coming off of a, a shoulder surgery and just got back right before they shut down. So, I mean, it's not even a competition right now. Like, I smoked him. 
but <laughs> in their uh, in their prime, I mean, uh, you know, they're both terrific drivers and they're great brothers. They they cheer for me and we all cheer for each other. So uh, three way dead heat, I'll say. Won't step on any toes. Good answer. Yeah, good answer. Oh, you know what, uh, James? Uh, you guys are terrific, and uh, you do so much for the game on and off the track as well. Great interview tonight, and uh, I know your uh, mom and dad, Freddie and Gail, would be uh, very happy uh, and proud of you. And and um, it's great to to be able to connect with you during these times. And I know there's some great news coming out of Ontario there, or at least you know getting getting the horses back on the track, and uh, you'll be back uh, in the bike again. So we just want to take an opportunity to uh, wish you all the best this season and uh thanks for joining us tonight on the virtual tack room all right thanks a lot again for having me guys and i want to send a shout out to my uh buddies in ontario from pei shane baglow johnny mckinnon mark mckinnon i know they're tuned in they always watch so uh and hi to everyone back home hopefully see you in august thanks james thank you james thanks james all right thanks guys Okay, so the virtual tack room continues here tonight as we get to the uh, third quarter. And, uh, boy, we're excited to get this uh, young gentleman on tonight. We had a, an addition with him on uh, the inside track back when we launched the show uh, last year. Uh, but he's uh, he's turned into a great driver. He's got some great horses. He and uh, his partner, Melissa Rennie, as well, have been doing some great work with the ownership ranks. We'll hear more of that. And we've selected a few of his big moments as well in the sport and it's a pleasure tonight to have Adam Murner on the show with us tonight. Uh, Adam, are you there? Yes. Good evening, boys. How are you doing? Oh, well, there yeah. you are, Adam. Good to see you. <laughs> I just wanted to say, if I can ever find a horse as long winded as James and Smitty, we're going to be doing all right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they, they're into the stories tonight. Uh, I know you're a fan of the virtual attack room. We were talking earlier in the week and how much you've enjoyed uh seeing all the different guests and hearing all the the great uh horses as well i gotta tell you when when we were we made the announcement that you were coming on the show tonight too we had a number of people reaching out to us and and uh couldn't wait to uh to hear your segment as well and see some of your your great moments i want to start with uh how we normally like to start the show and just you know find out how you and melissa and your families are doing uh you know over the past number of weeks during uh during the time that we're going through we're doing really well, Lee. Um, we're keeping busy at work and uh, keeping the stable going. Uh, pretty, pretty big selection of horses there. And uh, my little fella Jackson, he's four years old. He's as busy as three kids. So there's not a lot, a lot of downtime around here. Uh, no, we're doing, we're doing pretty well. Excellent. You know, uh, we're going to roll into many different areas of your business here on and off the track uh, for tonight. But uh, we want to take you back to the guests that are joining us on Facebook tonight and those who are joining us on our, our, our other network. Uh, how did Adam Murner get his start in the, in the harness racing uh, business? Well, Lee, I was uh, born into a harness racing family. Um, I was probably eight or nine years old, the first time I jogged my first horse. Uh, I remember we used to, Thursday nights we'd race at Tartan Downs back home in Cape Breton. Uh, I think it was probably seven, seven thirty post. I was just a little fella. We'd go, we'd have, we usually have a horse and later that night and uh, our whole family would be there. And let's just say I probably missed a few Friday mornings at school because I'd be a little tardy at the start getting up the next morning, that's for sure. But it was always a lot of fun. Adam, do you remember your first horse uh, that you had? Uh, and uh, do you recall your first drive uh, over there? The first horse I owned that I looked after, his name was Hardware, but the first horse that I drove, that's actually a funny story. His name was Political Crisis. I, I raced him over here for quite a few years, actually. Uh, the day that he was in to go, I never even had my license. I had, I don't know if I had needed 15 or 20 points to, to get my license. And I had, I, we used to always have eight or nine horses and uh, they were all in to qualify because I probably needed 15 points. So I figured in Cape Breton, if you just put them on the front and 
be lucky enough to win. You don't fall off. You should probably get your five points. So I, that's what I did. I put all three of them on the front. And I got my license that day, and there was a fellow driving by the name of Sean Link. And uh, after I got my license, the judges called, and I called. I went over and I seen Sean. And I told him, I said, Sean, I got my license. Like we're pretty good buddies, but we're not that good buddies. I'm going to drive today, and he had no problem with it. He laughed. So anyways, I drove the horse. I think I left five with him. It was my first drive and uh, I got away sitting seventh. So I was fairly nervous, I'm not gonna lie to you. And I'll never forget it. I was coming to the half and I moved out. I was sitting third or fourth over and the old horse, I moved him up the backside. I was probably three or four deep and it was just like the ball cutting size so she was all guns and blaze. And I ended up winning the race and I'll never forget it. Chain Ryan gave me the rip in the winner circle. He said, Adam Werner, Sent all three of them down the road in the qualifier. Why wouldn't he do it in the final? And it was quite a day for me. It's just, it wasn't a real big race, but it was my first win, and I'll never ever forget it. That's for sure. Can you tell us a little bit about some of the fellows you looked up to, uh, Adam, as a young fellow and uh, as idols uh, growing up? Yeah, sure, Jerry. I. Obviously, I looked up to my mother and my father. My mom, she, we always had horses at the barn, and uh, she, she loved them all—the good, the bad, the ugly. Didn't matter what they were; she thought they were all great. She taught me a lot about caring for the horse and uh, braiding his fur and his mocking stalls, to brushing them, to turning them out, to just getting to know the animal. And uh, my dad, he was an excellent blacksmith, uh, trainer, driver. I remember sometimes I'd go to Turo when he was up there, he'd have a stable, he'd, me and my brother, we'd go up and, uh, and he'd be getting them. When I was a little fella, it wasn't the Amish truck that they'd come from, it'd be, in little harsher words, the meat truck. And he'd take these things off that had a problem, either they'd hit a knee or they'd cross fire or they'd do something they weren't supposed to be doing. And he'd take them off the truck and it could be three or four training trips that day, but he would figure them out. And, <clears throat> He had some luck doing that, and he was a great, great farrier, a great horse horseman, and I always looked up to him for that. And uh, when I moved to PEI, Ronnie Gas, he took me in under his wing. He gave me a chance. He probably didn't agree with everything that I always did, but he never used his seat. Ronnie, everybody knows him. He's very, he's a man of very few words. He probably just let me go about my thing, and when he realized that. It wasn't going to work he would speak up and when he did speak up you may as well listen to him because he's usually right but no i they're about the just a couple of them there's i could look up to anybody all the dab dogs everybody looks up to them but when you start out that's a good start adam it's kent here you and melissa have uh, certainly developed into a very successful public stable but can you share with us what it was like to get to get started uh, with your own stable? Yeah, uh, Kent, I moved to PEI, it was 2014. Uh, we had four or five horses at the time. I went to work for Ronnie shortly after. Uh, I was very lucky I got the, the chance to look after Pulse, uh, Bo's Cowboy. I trained him at two, and then Magical Mistress, Buddy White, a nice trotter. And then Ronnie also gave me a lot of nice drives on uh, some pretty nice horses, Smiley by Emma, Cali Van Hanover, Pleasure Girls. But it wasn't, it wasn't any other. I'm very lucky in PEI. There's been lots of great people give me drives, like uh, Terry Gallant, Euchre, Walter Walker. Ball forward, pretty and dangerous. Maybe well give him a shout out because I know he's watching. Uh, and then when you drive nice horses, people notice you guys. Like I don't know when you're in when you're doing good, everybody notices the when you're doing good. When you're doing poor, a lot of people notice when you're doing poor too, I guess. But uh, no, I met a lot of nice people through then that wanted to buy horses, and they gave me a shot, and we had some luck with it, and. Right now, I think there's 22 horses in the stable, so we're doing all right. So, uh, Adam, we're going to go to Bo's Cowboy here, and uh, I know uh, this horse just seemed to fit you. 
Um, tell us about Bose Cowboy and uh, Alec McPhee and, and that relationship you have with Alec and that horse. I think pretty special to you. Yeah, Bo was really special to me. I remember the first day I started working at Ronnie's, he was in the stall, just down to the shell left. And when I started at Ronnie's, I was the new guy, so I knew Corey more than anybody else. And Corey was telling me, well, you go with him, you'll do this, you'll do that. So, of course, that's what I was doing. And we ended up teaming up and we uh, trained two colts together. Bo's Cowboy was one of them, Magical Cowboy was another one. And Corey's probably watching the night, so I may as well give him a little rip too. I, I used to put a spanking on him in the training trips a lot of times, but uh, no, I'm just joking. But uh, yeah, no, Bo was a great little horse. He had his quirks about him, be it two and three, like at two, he was a little fiery and you had to know him. At three, I was lucky enough to get to drive him. And uh, a lot of people don't know this, but Walter Chevry, he drove him a couple of times and Walter said, you should open this horse up. And I wasn't on PEI at the time. I looked after him, but I was home for something. And uh, I remember calling Corey on the phone and I said, you're really putting an open bridle on Bo's cowboy? And Corey said, yeah, Walter wants it. I said, he's a brave man. Because I used to jog him at the farm with it on and I'd end up in center field more times than I'd end up in the racetrack. But whatever it was, it clicked with him and he had a pile of speed. And when I got to drive him, he was just starting to peak and everything worked out perfect. Well, let's watch this race here, uh, Breeders' Crown Weekend, uh, back in 2016. Here's Bose Cowboy and Adam Erner uh, winning. Down the stretch they come. They're in front of us. First time around, arriving at the half. Led there on the front end, Bose Cowboy. Here comes Hart and Soul. Up and after the leader in the outside second. Luke's Cowboy in the pocket third. Jackson K down fourth. Hamax Blackjack in the outside fifth. Magical Cowboy six. Abner the Great seventh. Dusty Lane Arby is caught. Trailing eight. 57. Four was the half. They're on the back stretch. Second and final time. Three quarter pole land. They go there next. On the rail, Bose Cowboy, the leader. Heart and Souls under urging. Luke's Cowboy capping at the rail third. Tie on the outside fourth. Abner the Great coming late. Three quarters of a mile in one. 27 flat. They're down to an eighth of a mile to go. Bo's Cowboy still there. Abner the Great in between horses, heart and soul. They're in deep. Now coming to the wire. Bo's Cowboy has won it. The Atlantic Breeders' Crown Championship Final. Bo's Cowboy, Murner, Gas, McPhee, 156 and 4. You know, Adam, uh, when you look over that race, I remember that day, what a special moment that was for all the connections, and you get a chance to view it again there. Um, just a great performance, and how special was that, especially uh, with Breeders' Crown Final, was that for you that day? That was huge, Lee. Like, uh, that was my first Breeders' Crown. It was race 15. It was probably the longest day of my life going through that card. My, most of my whole family was there. Alex was there. Great fella. We collect great right from day one. Audrey, everybody, nephew Bailey's in the win photo. Alexis got him at this. Uh, it was a great day. Bo was a pretty special horse to me. I, I really appreciate him, that's for sure. Shifting gears a little bit, Adam, uh, fractional ownership is the way of the future becoming very popular these days. You and your team have had done a great job of attracting some new owners to the game, and you've had a lot of success. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Uh, I guess with me, the fractional ownership gets started. It was, uh, I can't let him wait with a couple of horses at the barn with me. And and uh, we did try to get their stress and victorious.
I think we just uh, have an interrupt, uh, interruption there, and uh, we'll see if we can get Adam Murner back there. That's uh, what happens with live shows every now and then in the virtual attack room. But uh, I'm glad he's going to key in a little bit on the uh, fractional ownership because I know he and Melissa have done a tremendous Hello. job. Uh, there, I think he's back now. There yeah. he is. Yeah. Okay. I froze up there. No, um, that's uh, a little horse with men coming way. We end up, I got introduced to Brad and Beth McPherson and Tom Kong Zang, my brother, Max Seal. Uh, they, they purchased the horse. So it wasn't a lot of money, but we had a lot of fun with them. And it's funny. Every time we'd win, we'd be pretty happy in the winner circle. And uh, everybody would be high-fiving. So next thing you know, it's sale time. And uh, we come up with a group, High Five Racing. And that's I, Lynn Livingston, Ken, Wade, Keith Paul, Jeremy Hoffman, and Jeff Gamble, the uh, longtime owner that I had. We decided to go to the sale. We were going to buy two, two cults. We've got a cult in Philly, uh, Windermere Ryan and Dusty Lane Trista. It's kind of a bittersweet story. Windermere Ryan turned out to be a, a very nice little horse. And Trista, she had some issues last year, but so far this year, it looks like she's going to be okay. Um, we bought them horses and we had a lot of fun with them. And uh, that was one group. And then we this year came, we had more people interested. So uh, High Five Two, we named this, the next group. And it was the same group, only we touched into a little bit of the uh, international owners. And we bought two more cults, another cult in Philly, uh, Windermere Best Man, and uh, Must Be Somebody's Baby, which both are very, very nice cults in Philly, and uh, we're hoping for big things from them. And then I have, uh, we, or we have another group, um, JTL Risk from Cape Breton, back where I come from. Uh, Joel LeBlanc, Tyler Link, Ian McKinnon, great group of guys. And they're affiliated with uh, two cults we have, the Big Chase, Sam Mac Napoleon, which are two very nice three-year-olds that are coming back good. And um, the last group is Boys Will Be Boys Racing. It's uh, Mike May is the head of, head of that group. The... Uh, has a three-year-old filly in the stable with us right now, and they were interested in getting a colt sale, but it didn't turn out that way. So when a colt became available that I was training, they jumped all over it. And I think there's eight or 10 of them involved in him. And it, uh, he's a very nice colt. He's a steelhead. He's a half brother to Magical Mistress, and things look pretty good for him right now. So we're very excited. You're very busy, Adam. I, I'd like to ask you about the driving colony on Prince Edward Island and in the Maritimes, but you drive mostly on PEI. Um, Adam, you're one of the best, but I mean, it's competitive week in, week out, wouldn't you say? It's extremely competitive, Peter. There's uh, top 10s to drive for charity. There's 15 to 18. Anybody can. It's basically luck of the dry. You've got to have a good horse and you've got to be lucky because Prince Edward Island. As far as I'm concerned, is as tough as anywhere in Atlanta, Canada. Like the drivers, they're professionals. They're a great group of guys. We all look out for each other, and uh, no, it's it's great right now. Adam, uh, we're going to be looking at a, a race from uh, the 2018 British Crown with a Magical Mistress. Uh, you competed with her for a sensational season in 2018. Starts 12 wins. Uh, over 71,000 in earnings, two-year-old record of 56 and one taken over Summerside. Just uh, if you could tell us about your experience of driving Magical Mistress, and it, it um, uh, you know, very, uh, uh, she was an exceptional filly, but did you ever uh, feel any additional pressure trying to keep that undefeated uh, streak going with her? Yeah, I can't. I felt pressure every time I sat behind her, not behind her, until I sat behind her, I should say, because she was the best. And um, I I did feel pressure, yes. When you get behind her and you get in behind the gate and you're, after the race, when everything's said and done, you sit back and say, I'm foolish not to, or foolish to feel the pressure. But she was such a nice filly. Like, 
you could drive her as long as you didn't fall off. You had a, you were she was gonna take you where you need to be. Like that day in Truro was, was probably as pretty as poor drives I could ever give her. And she still found a way to win. She was uh, mistress was basically some uh, the type of filly that every person should have in their barn because she was phenomenal. It's a shame what happened, what went on with her. I mean, her career. I'm hoping that she's going to return, but as a three-year-old, she was she was cut short. I was very high on seeing what she could do at three. Mm -hmm. Adam, let's look at that two-year-old race, the Atlantic Breeders' Crown, back in 2018, and uh, again, just an awesome Philly magical mistress. Here she is. Two-year-old Philly Pacers. Up and pacing, magical mistress coming from the outside towards the rail. Juxty Lane, Buck and Beauty between them. The real deal firing out. Fourth as they move round the turn, Woodmere Tango moving up fifth is Mount Rebel. Then in sixth towards the rail, Foxy Gigolo. Away seventh, Elm Grove Nelly, the early trailer. That's how Max Sabrina to the back stretch they go. The real deal on the engine for Chevrolet. Magical mistress. Tucked in second. Third up the rail is Tuxty Lane, Buck and Beauty. Woodmere Tango back into fourth. Check it out. Solid opener. 28. One. Round the turn they go. And it's the real deal, the leader. On her back, the undefeated magical mistress. Third, Dusty Lane, Buck and Beauty. We we're at track record time at the opening quarter. Chevrolet's trying to back them up at the opening half mile. The real deal getting them there. Oh, and out pops Woodmere Tango. Ma Rebel, she was already there. 57 and one was the half. Moving over to the 5'8", the real deal, the leader. Magical Mistress is second. Third up the rail, Dusty Lane, Buck and Beauty. Between horse and Woodmere Tango, fourth. Ma Rebel got the three wide treatment, fifth. And there's the inquiry shine. Six is how Max Sabrina. Elm Grove Nelly on the outside, seventh. Foxy Gigolo in the backfield, 127 and 2, down at three quarters. Magical Mistress strikes the lead with an eighth of a mile to go. The real deal, now second. Coming third, Ma Rebel. They're in deep stretch now. Here she is, folks. The real thing here. Magical Mistress. In the Atlantic Breeders' Crown Championship Final, Murner doubles up. The Phillies perfect. 10, 1, 56, 1. Adam, here's the uh, slow-mo coming through the stretch here that day. What a, uh, just an awesome way to, to end off the season there with that, uh, or end off the Breeders' Crown on that day. It was interesting, you know, uh, when we were looking back over the race, you said to me in the winter circle that day, because she, you could track that helmet all day. And as soon as you moved off Walter's back there, she was just like a light switch gone. Yeah, Lee, like um, when you move on coming into the turn and pad, the real deal is a nice belly. When you pass him before you come out of the turn, you're doing some pace. And then if you watch the re, I watch the replay a thousand times up the backside, she was loaded. As soon as I moved her, she just, she was a winner. That's all I can say about her. <laughs> didn't matter how you drove her, didn't matter what you did, she loved it. Very nice, Philly. There's Abby there. She did a great job with her all summer long. She loves moving. My little fella Jackson, girl from Melissa. Very, he's going to pop into the scene here soon. Yeah, there he is. <laughs> Pretty happy group right there, guys. I love that. Uh, Adam, what are some of your goals for this season? Well, some of my goals are we got 13 state cults, so we got a lot of hopes and dreams with them. Obviously, everybody does, but I mean, a couple of, couple of them can, um, they're showing me a lot of talent. If they can stay together and we can keep healthy and sound, hell never knows, Lee. Like, all you can do is. The, what gets you to go to the barn in the morning is what if, right? So we're going to keep going, and we got a couple aged horses there, and I uh, got a couple horses for, for the 
Dan Oz, Dale and Ronnie Ronnie, they're great guys. Wade. The all's good right now. We're just looking forward to getting back to the gate. Uh, Adam, uh, you guys, you had a remarkable achievement last year with uh, uh, three horses in the um, Breeders' Crown final for two-year-old pacing Colts and finishing first, second, and third with Windermere Ryan, the big chase, and Mr. Kelly. How are they coming back for their uh, their career or their campaign this year? They're doing real well, Kent. All three of them have been 2-7, two, 2-8. Two, They're strong. Ryan, he's just a sweet little horse. He's... He's not real big, but he's thick, and he's got the will to, to be a racehorse. Kelly, he's a very nice horse, very talented. He seems he had a couple of issues last year, but I think we got him straightened away. He's training down Soper. And big Chase, he's doing very well, too. He had an early start at home in Cape Breton. The guys, they did a great job with him, Tyler and Ian, Joel. They came, they came to me, and he came to me in great shape, and another call, Tal McNapoli, and they look good. And, there's, so we got so we got five right now. So I got we got another cult there. Uh, Three year old magical Maddie's boy. He's a full brother to mistress. I'm lucky enough to own a part of him. Hopefully, God willing, knock on wood, he stays half sound and healthy. And we're looking forward to the state season. Well, Adam, uh, we hear from uh, a lot of folks. Uh, I'm, I'm watching a, a number of different uh, feeds here tonight, and um, there's a lot of folks uh, writing in, uh, wishing you best of luck, you and Melissa, for the season as well, and all your ownership team. Heard from Shane Ryan, uh, who uh, has, you have two records at Northside. He called your first career win, and uh, yeah. he was very excited to see you on, on the show tonight. So uh, you got a lot of fans out there and, and a lot of connections. So. Um, we want to take the opportunity to wish you all the best this season. You and Melissa do a great job uh, prepping your horses and getting them ready to go on track, and you do an awesome job with your ownership groups and fractional ownership and getting new people to the game. So we thank you for that, and we want to wish you best luck this season. Thanks for joining us on the Virtual Attack Room. Thanks, guys. You do a great job, Joey. Watch the show since it started, and uh, there's no I in team. We're all going to go forward together, and next week we're going back qualifying. So. Better days ahead. Excellent. Take care, Thank guys. You, Thanks a lot, Adam. Take care. You Thanks, too, Adam. Adam. All right, so another great show for tonight, guys. Uh, you know, um, Gerard Smith, um, James McDonald, and Adam Murner. And uh, I got to tell you, if there's one thing that uh, is really um, virtual attack room has done, I believe, is that it's educated a lot of folks that are, you know, in the game now. And of course, uh, has an opportunity to show just what great talent we've had uh, in all spectrums, whether it's racing or sport in general. And I think that's what this show has uh, has done tonight. I agree, Lee. I think it's connected so many people through this uh, last couple of months here. We, we needed something to bring us together. And uh, the people we've had on have been tremendous stories, be it young or old, Lee, people who have raced from the 60s and 70s all the way up to the current day. We've had some terrific stories, Lee, and it just shows how great this game is. And uh, I think people have really appreciated uh, the last seven or eight weeks and, and the show. Well, thanks very much, Peter. A good night to you. And we look forward to signing up the show of next week. Uh, Jerry McCabe, uh, thank you. Uh, another great show tonight in the virtual attack room. And, uh, of course, we'll be setting up our, our Monday night call here to, to see who we can get for the next week. But we have no shortage of requests and no shortage of great history on this show for sure. Agree. Always a fun trip down memory lane, near and far, and uh, some great stories, some great memories, and great insights. Uh, great to have someone like Gerard Smith to show a little bit about what happens behind the scene to make it all happen on Thursday, Saturday night. Uh, and uh, great doing it again. Have a great week, guys. We'll be back at the live before we know it, and looking forward to that, too. All right. Good night, Jerry. And Ken Oaks, um, well, we wrap things up here tonight with another edition of Virtual Attack Room. And I, I know that uh, you've worked with Smitty a lot over the years. Uh, and I, I think it's fair to say that when we lean on him uh, in a lot of cases for putting in some, some, you know, checking on the horse population and seeing how we can really put together some great races, I'm really glad that he took the time to, to give us a little behind the scenes look tonight of how it all comes together. For sure, Lee. Uh, you know, Smitty is an, is an exceptional quality person, and you're right. I've had a, 
a great uh, chance to work with him for a long time over the years, including, uh, and, uh, you know, it wasn't us uh, as a committee, I'll, I'll say that, that selected the uh, uh, the uh, committee as the, the chair of the uh, Council of Atlantic Premier's Task Force on Racing, although we certainly endorsed it. Uh, but it was it was selected by the three ministers responsible when they looked at the at the people that were involved in it, and they made an exceptional selection of Smitty. He was a, a great chairman and gave a lot of credibility to what we to what we did. And you know, it's it's he's a, an indication of the of the great people we've had involved in this business over the years. You know, James McDonald, another exceptional young man who's done PEI proud by going away and to conduct himself the way he he has both on and off the track and. And Adam Merner is, uh, you know, another indication of the great people we have uh, coming up in their careers in Atlantic Canada. And uh, I think we just had a, another exceptional show. Just need you your uh, mic there, Lee. Well, thanks very much, Kent. Uh, you know, a good night to you. And uh, we'll be back again with the Monday night uh, call here and uh, set things up for another edition of the virtual attack room. Uh, once again, we want to thank uh, McRae Backhoe and Trucking uh, and McRae Racing. Donnie McRae, thank you very much uh, for your sponsorship tonight. And uh, we're going to end off with a couple of uh, couple of uh, notes here. Uh, first of all, I want to thank all of the people that are sending notes through. I, I know it's difficult uh, when we're we're live theater here and we're, and we're and we're trying to go back and forth, so we we can't respond to a, a lot of you, and and we apologize for that. But we do see your comments, and and we certainly do appreciate them uh, coming through. There was another note that came through tonight that I do want to address, and that is um, with the decision around the live racing uh, on June June the fourth. Uh, as you know, we work very closely with uh, the public health officials and the province of Prince Edward Island, and. Uh, Red Shores, along with Harness Racing Industry, um, we put together the best possible proposal that we could at the time to get live racing back uh, with a limited number of people. Uh, that's the way it has to be starting off. It's not the way it's going to be moving forward, but that's the way it's got to be starting off. So I know there's some owners out there and some other people who feel that, you know, we'd like to get to the track. There's nobody who wants you at the track more than all of us. Uh, but let's get through this first phase and let's uh, get the horses and uh, the drivers, the trainers, the grooms, and, and, the, and the people that need to be there. Let's get this rolling first, and uh, we'll go from there. So we do appreciate that, and that's just a, an address to uh, some of the, the one of the comments coming in tonight. So this brings us to the end of the show. Uh, I try each week to leave with a positive message. It's not only good for me, but I hope it's good momentum for you. It's hard to put in words to describe what we've all been going through in the past number of weeks. Uh, each of us has different challenges in our personal and professional lives. Some takeaways to consider. Live racing will return to Charlottetown on June the 4th and without spectators and work is going on with the Summerside operation. Both tracks are getting complete upgrades for their equine athletes. Uh, management and industry uh, continue to work together and have a very strong attitude. Uh, this show, the virtual attack room, has brought us together in a time when we had to stay apart. Uh, the track cam allowed owners to stay connected when access to the track was limited. Our team continues to work with online betting platforms to engage more players, especially on pre-EI. And we are working with ProLine in the hopes of adding harness racing to the platform. And there's a new uh, forum called Dark Horse from Woodbine that Adam Walsh and I continue to work on as well. New owners and horses have been added to the island roster, and our island industry leads the country with youth. So there will be no doubt that our operations will look a bit different when we reopen. But outside-the-box thinkers like all of us I refuse to stand still while the world is still on pause, and we will be back. In closing, we have to look a little harder for the positive these days, but it's there. Stay strong and stay safe. I'm Lee Drake, and on behalf of all of us for the Virtual Attack Room, Thanks for joining us. Good night.